the more I can feel like I'm just being super honest about everything, the more I can really feel connected to people and connected to my own journey. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are sharing lessons from an adventure enthusiast and creative. It's an inspiring conversation about intentional living, how to move through life's challenges, and live aligned to your joy. Our guest today is Chelsea Kawai. Chelsea is an adventure enthusiast, filmmaker, advocate for intentional living, and journalist who pivoted into a full-time creator. She has worked with clients such as Canon and the National Parks Foundation. Foundation and had three eco-innovative product launches. She's been featured in Forbes, Travel and Leisure, Women's Health, Huffington Post, and more. Before we get into it, I want to let you know that we're launching the new 2023 Artist of Life Workbook this Thursday, October 20th. The Artist of Life Workbook is our top-selling guided journal to help you create your most intentional and successful year. You can find it when it comes out at shop.lavendaire.com. So without further ado, here's Chelsea Kawai. Hello, Chelsea. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you? I am so well. I'm so excited to be here. It's taken us two busy souls a few few weeks to connect. (laughs) I know. We've rescheduled this a couple times. You're such a busy girl. Um, But I'm excited to learn more about you and your life. So why don't you start by just giving us a quick background of your story? Like, How did you begin as a creative? What led you down the path of doing what you do now? There's so many different ways I feel like I could go about this story or tell this story, but I guess the way that feels the most true for me is, so I grew up on this like super small island on Kauai, uh, where I still live. I'm here right now. And I have always been really into two things. So one is being in nature, like being outdoors. That's just such a core part of growing up here and feeling like I don't know, feeling a sense of belonging here was just when I'm in the ocean or when I'm in the mountains. Um, And then the other part that I've always loved and it's been a core aspect for me is design. I've always loved interior design and I thought I was going to be an architect at one point. I was a graphic designer prior to becoming this version of a creative. So design or just how to kind of like curate things in a way that feels meaningful has always been this big part of my life and it's just created or it's it's manifested itself in different ways and I think the most um yeah the most honest answer is to be like I've just always loved design and now I get to design my life and to share about that on social media um in a way that I guess has inspired other people which is really really cool yeah. yeah. I think what's really like impactful about your work is it's not only beautiful, like your photos, videos, everything is gorgeous, you included, but it's like, you have such like a deep meaning behind the content you create, whether it's like very inspirational or it talks about nature or like they're, they're, they're like real deep topics that I really love. So <laughs> um, going back to your story, when you were young, like, did you have a dream to become anything? Like how... At what age did you know, like, this is what you wanted to do? I actually always thought I was going to be an architect. That was my thing that I thought I was going to do. That was, you know, when I graduated, I applied to architecture schools. And uh, so, no, like, content creation wasn't it. I don't think it was even a thing (laughs) when I was going to school or growing up. It was not on anyone's radar. I was actually really, really late in the sense of adopting, you know, like, all of my friends already had smartphones. I didn't, I had like a little razor flip phone or something. And uh, when I got on social media, I remember I, I, you know, I was on Instagram and I didn't even realize you were supposed to follow people. I was just kind of like, I don't know what this app is and everything. Um, And it felt really late at that time, which now looking back, I think is funny. We have this sort of like odd perception in our minds that like, oh, I'm already too late for this trend or I'm already like, there's so many people doing this thing. And when I got on social media, there are, or there were already people with a million followers or there were already people who were doing this full time, a much smaller amount, but I felt very late coming into it. And I thought, ah, do I really want to leave, you know, 
my job and all these things that were pretty secure and stable for me at the time. Oh, so you were pursue... already like as an architect? Or in no, design? I had graduated and I was, I was working a bunch of different jobs. Actually, I was doing private tour guiding. I was doing graphic design um, and I was doing some kind of like uh, creative work for small brands and agencies. And so I had, you know, like a pretty good thing going on and it felt really risky to leave all of that. Um, I was really, really happy. You know, I was getting to be outside. I was getting to work with small businesses. I was, I was super stoked, honestly. And, but this little thing kept pinging on this like social media journey of different opportunities that were so unique. Uh, and I remember telling a friend, I was like, I don't know if I should just try this thing and maybe give it a little bit more attention for a little bit, but there's no way it's, it's only going to last, you know, maybe a year or two more max. And do I really want to leave behind my whole, everything else that I'm doing to pursue this fleeting career as I saw it at the time. Right. And, and I couldn't have been more wrong. You know, I couldn't have been more wrong about, about where it could go. And it really, I committed to that journey thinking, ah, I don't know, this might, you know, this might work, this might not. It just feels exciting. It felt exciting for me in that moment. So even if it wasn't going to last forever, I still wanted to see where it could go. Um, so I started putting a little bit more, you know, time and attention into social media and telling stories on there, traveling. And then it just, yeah, that was about 2014, 2015, I think. Right. And it's really been a journey. So with your like brand on social media, did you have like a vision in the beginning for what you wanted it to be or did it kind of develop? Like how has it changed from the beginning to who Chelsea Kawhi is now? <laughs> yeah. No, like I said, because it was sort of this thing that started off in some ways, I, I would say, you know, very casually or almost accidentally and uh, hesitantly, it wasn't like there was no brand strategy. I didn't have this like five year plan for it. So when it first started, what felt the most natural to me was sharing a lot about nature. It was, it was much more little person, big landscape, um, kind of more so about the places I was visiting or uh, going to, and less less so about my own internal like mental journey and. That was, yeah, that was kind of how I did it for, for a while. And it started to feel quite, you know, just like you get that itchy feeling where you're like, I feel like I'm in a box that's a little yeah. bit too small for me. Yeah. And uh, that started to come up. And what I noticed for me is I lose interest in something if it can't evolve and if it can't change with what's alive for me in that moment. So yeah, I got to a point of like, ah, this just doesn't feel quite true to me anymore. And I, I was making money at, on social media at that point, but it's kind of like, I don't, I don't really know, you know, it just, I was a little bit burnt out and a little bit confused. And, um, yeah, so I took a little break and I realized the disconnect for me was that there were so many other facets or things that were interesting to me in my life beyond just hiking or beyond just free diving. And what I was really falling in love with was, you know, just kind of the zoomed out bigger picture of like, what do these, what do these places teach me? What do these movement exercises give to me above and beyond just like I like to climb mountains. Yeah, it's be it's it's not just showing what's pretty like oh this looks this is a pretty picture of nature. It's like literally how is it affecting you, impacting you as a person and I it's almost like we're reading your journal sometimes when I read your captions. <laughs> and and I really like that vibe. I like that too. I find that the more the more I can feel like I'm just being super honest about everything, the less like walls and the less blocks I have. Uh, and the more I can really feel connected to people and connected to my own journey, you know, it doesn't become just this strange facade of pretty pictures. Um, you know, I love, I love being aesthetic. I love like 
you know, finding ways to capture things in the most beautiful way. But at the end of the day, when people come to me, I also want them to be getting that, like that sense of rawness and realness and to really, I think that's what for me inspires me and other people is seeing the back end of the journey or the things that they weren't super sure about or the edges that they're pushing into. So I try to reflect that in my own content as well. Yeah. Um, so I know that mindfulness is a big part of your life, like l- intentional living. So when and how did you discover mindfulness and what does it mean to you? I think getting into more mindfulness practices about five or six years ago now, um, it was actually like, I read a lot. And so books have been a big part of introducing me to new habits or just different ways of thinking. I had a friend that I was on a really long road trip with or road tripping all over the U S and he had a, a book. Um, and I think it was called 30, like 30 lessons for living well. Um, I don't even remember the title, but it was like 30 lessons for living well. And it was written from these interviews with people at the end of their life. Um, kind of exploring like what were the most meaningful parts of your life? Like what are your regrets? What are the things you wish you could change or anything? And that book and a few other books really hit home for me. Like, wow, these decisions that we're making in these small mundane everyday moments are really what end up transforming and creating the life that we're living now and our legacy and everything that we have to like look back on at the end of our lives. And what, what do I want mine to look like? What do I want mine to be? Uh, I think that was the first little seed that was planted. Um, and then, yeah, I just started writing a little bit more. I started journaling super sporadically. I didn't have any type of practice that I was like, I just want to try this out. And, um, yeah. And then I started to realize like the more consistent I got with journaling, uh, it was really helping me like discover things about myself that I didn't previously understand like I was always a super anxious person and and it really really helped me calm down and settle down and focus on things that were really like just a bit more like mattering to me in those moments versus getting so caught up in like how is this post doing or what is this number Mm. or what is everyone else doing just focusing inward a little bit more and finding that sense of calm so what is your current, I guess, mindfulness habits or routine? Do you have something that you do every day, every week? So I'm pretty consistent now for the last few years. My routine is largely based in the morning. So I do like, as soon as I get up, I'll do like a 10 minute, 12 minute meditation. And then from that meditation, I will go straight into journaling. So a lot of times the thoughts that are sparked there, I want to like capture or reflect on. Um, so I'll do the meditation and then journaling um, and usually have like my, my cup of tea and stuff all before I try to jump on my phone and jump on the emails and everything mm-hmm. like that. And I'm a big list person. So I like, I make lists all the time Yeah, <laughs> nice. and yeah, uh, because I find my mind is extremely scattered. So I'll yeah, meditate journal and then make my list for the day and It's really simple. I mean, it takes, you know, maybe 30 ish minutes of my morning, but I feel so much better. And I can really just tell the mornings that I do that versus the mornings that I get a bit carried away with other things. Right. So, with your lifestyle and what you do, it's kind of, it, in my eyes, it's kind of up to you. Like, how do you decide um, where you go? Or like, let's talk about like designing your lifestyle, designing your life. Because I do feel like that's a big part of who you are. I think the blessing and maybe shadow side of being a content creator, and I, I, I'm sure you feel this with yourself as well, is that in a lot of ways, you don't, there is no inherent structure. Like, if you want to do podcasts on a certain day, you can. And you can go anywhere. So it's, yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of structure to my life for a while. And, and then I started to think about like, okay, do I really want to be traveling 90% of the year? Does that feel good to me? And does that align with my like 
belief system and everything. So the first thing that happened was I started to decide like, okay, how much time do I want to spend traveling? How much time do I want to spend in different places? And um, what do I want my mornings to look like? And really just like, what do I want to feel like? So I cut way, way, way back on traveling, which is sad and a privilege all at the same time. But um, knowing that rest is important, staying in places for a longer amount of time became more important to me to have a deeper experience in those places and not just flitting Mm -hmm. around. Um, And uh, committing to my, you know, committing to my morning routine and um, just really trying to decide like what, like what feels good and prioritizing that. So getting more into like having a movement practice, doing acro yoga more often. And um, a lot of it just comes back to listening to my own body and being like, okay, I need to move today or I need to be outside a little bit more. Um, But yeah, with a job with no structure, I tried to create what what is my dream here? Like I I'm so lucky and so blessed to like not have to be at a certain place at a certain time. Um, but I also don't want to just like sit on the couch and watch Netflix all day. Or right. something. So, um, it's like, so, so where is that, you know, middle ground between like, okay, I want to play for this amount of time. I want to work. I want to spend time with my family. And it's, it's not perfect. I think anytime we're, we're designing something, from scratch, whether that's a product or your masterpiece of a life, there's, there's infinite, A, there's infinite possibilities for that. And there's also infinite like moments of correction and um, weaving into like different scenarios. So yeah, I just really reflected on what works for me. So from meditation, I realized like, okay, I want to like have my mornings look this way. I want to like exercise this much and then making it a commitment, like putting it in the calendar to, uh, to have it concretely there. Yeah. Love that. Um, I'm also curious logistically, cause I know a lot of people, when they look at your Instagram, for example, you're going to so many different places, going on all these adventures. So like, do you plan, like how much work goes into like planning like that image, like I'm sure you have like a team that you tr- travel with and people that have to dive in there with you. Are these just friends that you go with? Are they like, how does it work? <laughs> and how often are you doing this? Like, I don't even know how it works because <laughs> my, my type of content creating, I'm just at home. Everything is, I just have film on a tripod. I don't have to go on the mountain or in the water. So, so give us like a little taste of that life. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny to me. It's so natural. Like, I know. Cause oh, you're like, talking, I, I think you're brushing over that part. You're just, you're talking about everything around it, but I'm like, wait, but how does it work? Yeah. So I guess like with my job, for example, I have a job coming up where, um, they're like, Hey, we need you to film two reels or even if it wasn't a job, even if it was just for my own content, but mm-hmm. I'll use this as a concrete example. Um, so it's going to be around free diving and I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to just like do something really basic. I want it to be like really, really cool. Um, I, every year I go to Moorea for whale season. So it's like, okay, for these two videos, I'm going to fly to Tahiti to dive with whales. I'll probably spend six days, eight hours a day out on the water. Um, looking for whales, diving, hoping <laughs> we get the right conditions. And um, and then, yeah, I usually bring on board another creative, like a, someone to help me shoot. So there will be two of us. And um, yeah, we'll film all, all week probably. And then I'll come back and look at all the content, put together two videos. So that's sort of like the level of, I guess, um, effort (laughs) that goes into the things that I create it is a bit more extensive yeah that is a lot of effort just for because because you have to plan to be there the whole week and you don't even know if you're going to see whales (laughs) yeah it's just so 
it's, it's some, some things are in my control and I can set myself up to have a bunch of different ideas and be as prepared as I can. Um, and I, I work with people who I really trust and I really know, and I know that we're both willing to like put in the work in that way. But at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff I'm doing, it's weather dependent, it's wildlife dependent. It is, you know, we're just hoping for the best. Right. What about for the content that's like not for a brand, but just for yourself? Do you go to the extent to plan trips like that? Or like, how do you yes. plan that? <laughs> well, see, that's I amazing. Do. That's do. what's amazing. Like no one's making you do that. <laughs> no. And that's the thing that's really funny is like the brands actually don't care as much as I care. And that's what I've realized is it's I do this because that is the part that lights up my freaking soul. You know, like I think it's such a privilege to be able to design my life in this way where I get to seek out these really unique experiences. Like no brand is saying, Hey, you need to go do a seven day horseback riding safari across <laughs> Namibia. They don't care. Yeah. And I'm like, I you could be in your backyard and make that video. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like there's no outward pressure, but I think that's, what's beautiful about, you know, uh, getting like getting so clear in your own mind about what you love and what are the things that light you up? Because I know that even though it is so much more effort and it's not that anyone else has this expectation of me. It is just a purely a thing that I do for myself because this is the way that I believe I was designed to live. And that is, this is the way that I believe I bring a, the most joy to myself and also the most joy to the world through the, through that process. I love that. I I think it's amazing because you, you found that thing that lights you up and you, you no one's making you do it. You just do it. And it does bring joy to everyone who sees it. I like to think that when you're, you know, when you're like living in your purpose, I guess, that that is the most magnetic you become. And that is the, the place from which you have the most to offer to the world as well. So I used to feel like it was really selfish to kind of maybe, you know, chase these things or that, um, or prioritize these things that bring me so much joy. Um, but I just realized whether that was my journey of free diving or highlining or, um, you, you know, going and swimming with whales or doing these different things. Those are actually the touch points that people come back to so often with me and are like, Hey, that actually, got me to get over my fear of the water or of the ocean. And mm. that really inspired me to like, and it changed my life in this way. And it's like, yeah. oh. I love that. Do you want to share some advice for people who want to start, you know, living in alignment, like doing the thing that makes them happy? Because in your scenario, I, on one hand, it's easy because it brings you joy. But on the other hand, it took a lot of effort to, to, to make live that way. Right. So so was there a time that you didn't live in, in alignment and what advice do you have for people who, who want to do that? Yeah, I think the times where I have struggled the most um, or felt the most resistance, yeah, were those times that I was trying to do something because I felt like I needed to. I felt like everyone else was doing it. I felt like I was missing the boat somehow. So I think when the motivation is external in the sense of it's coming from comparison or a desire to like not miss out on what other people are doing, uh, it's not as powerful. It's not as like authentically you. And what I really love about this concept of alignment is like I believe every person is an intersection of so many unique facets that like only you can bring to the world or only you can do. So for me, when I started living in alignment, it was when I actually started merging all of those facets of myself. Like, so not only the creative aspect and writing things that felt deeply meaningful to me and sharing about my life relationships, like journey. Um, it was kind of like the, 
aggregation of all of those, of honoring mm. all of those aspects for yeah. me. Um, so what I, I guess, would encourage for people is to, first of all, like, get quiet, look inward, because there is like an inner knowing in all of us that is so much more powerful than all the like chatter or advice or things that are happening around us. And then to, from that place of like knowing and worthiness, um, to, yeah, honor and, and think about what are those facets about you that you can merge together to create a life that is super, super unique to you. And, um, and then to, then to chase that. Um, but I think it comes from getting quiet first. Yeah. I love that so much. And I agree with you. You, it's, it's, you are so unique, like all the little things that bring you joy that make you shine, like to find a way to like merge them (laughs) and that, that is like the key. Um, and, and to those who are listening, who like, don't know, have no idea what that is. Like it, that's life. Life is the journey of like figuring that out almost. For sure. I mean, I'm 33, I'm turning 34. This journey has taken me years, if not decades. These skills have taken years, if not decades. Like none of this was an overnight thing. None of this just appeared out of thin air, you know? And so it is, it's like this journey of becoming. And uh, there's a really awesome kind of like philosopher philosopher guy I don't know if you listen to Naval he does um Mm -hmm. some super cool podcasts and stuff but yeah yeah so uh he says like keep redefining what you do until like you're the only person in the world that does it and you're the like keep redefining what you do until you're the best in the world because you're the only person that does it and I've really always resonated with that that's really good. I love that. Let's talk about free diving a little bit because yes. I <laughs> I saw this stat that you can hold your breath underwater for four minutes and your deepest dives were 104 feet free diving underwater. Is that true? And how are you able to do this? Okay. A, it's true. Yes. I think my longest static breath hold. So there's a static breath hold where you're not, uh, you're not kicking. And that is just over, I think my longest one was about four minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, It is not comfortable. We'll not say, we'll not recommend it. (laughs) But uh, it is something that a lot more people can do than than they really think. Um, A lot of it is in your mind. And I think that's like my favorite part of free diving is learning the science, learning the techniques. But the vast majority of it is your own relationship with your mind. Wow. Because the breath is so important. Even it's like the key to like regulating your body. It's a key to like meditation, spirituality, everything. There's so many like breathing exercises. So I imagine that learning how to get to that point was a journey and it, and what did you learn from that? (laughs) Yeah. I know. Yeah. Just to echo what you said, I, I totally agree that the breath is this immensely powerful tool that I think a lot of us are only just starting to tap into now with breath work, with meditation, with more intentional breathing practices. And free diving was the first time that someone really talked to me a lot about what was happening in my body when I'm breathing. And and not only that, but what's happening in my body when I'm breathing or when I'm holding my breath, which is such a it's such a foreign thing. It's, it's like, it's quite scary in a lot of ways because it's just so not what we're designed to do in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I have taken quite a few classes on free diving where they do, you know, dive into like, what is the science in your body? How long can you, you know, safely hold your breath for? What are the different symptoms of, becoming what's called hypoxic, which is, um, you know, when it gets a little bit more dangerous because your oxygen levels are low. Um, so it starts with a basis of, of knowledge, but really what that journey of learning to hold my breath, um, has, I think taught me is this measure of 
A, being able to find calm in situations that feel challenging or situations that feel slightly out of control because the the first thing, you know, when you're free diving, your biggest challenge, I guess I would say, is actually that you want to lower your heart rate. So the more calm you can be, the more at ease you can be, the better your dive will feel, the better your breath hold will be. Uh, but there's, there is this part of our brain that wants to keep us safe, you know? And so as you're taking that breath at the surface, knowing, okay, I'm attempting to go down to a hundred something feet, um, your, your adrenaline starts going and everything starts tightening up and constricting and spiking. And you have to learn in those moments how to almost like talk to yourself and, and create like, like let go of that muscle tension and not be holding all this like stress or anxiety about your dive because that only hinders your performance. Yeah. So one finding calm in these moments that feel a little bit more challenging or chaotic has been a huge, huge thing in life and being able to take my free diving breath practice, I guess, and apply that to when I'm just sitting here in my house and getting a little bit nervous or stressed out about something. And then the second part that I really love is I think breath holding teaches you an immense amount of self-trust. And a lot of us these days, I think, don't completely trust ourselves or don't completely know ourselves. And in freediving, like no one else can tell you how you're feeling. No one else can tell you how long you can hold your breath for. They are not in your experience or not in your body knowing what you know. So a lot of these classes have taught me like how to recognize my own symptoms, how to recognize what is, you know, what is something I can push through and what is something that is a signal to pay, you know, pay more attention to and maybe back off a little bit. But you really have to find that parameter within yourself because no one can do it for you. So it's been an immense journey of learning how to trust my own body, trust my own mind, and to be able to only with my own, you know, with me empowering myself basically to be able to push through certain barriers. Yeah, that's amazing. I think those are such valuable lessons. Like you're so in tune with your body because you have to listen to it, like based on how wh- the, what the symptoms are. Um, that's crazy. And then, how does it feel when you're like? How do you know when you're at the lowest point and when, when you're ready to go up? I assume like when you're on the way up, you're. Do you get like nervous? Like I can't wait to take a breath. <laughs> are you like dying? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> It depends on the dive. And that's the really funny thing is I would imagine it's like runners going for a run. Some days you run 10 miles and you literally feel like you could run another 10 miles. And then other days you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot even make it up this hill. Yeah. (laughs) That's a bit how it is for me with free diving too. And it's honoring where my body is that day, where my mind Mm -hmm. is that day. Am I distracted? Am I really into it? Um, and not having this judgment of like, oh, I went deeper yesterday, so I should be able to probably be diving at that level today. It's like, no, like, yeah, every day is a little bit different, and I'm going to have compassion for myself in that way. But when we are training, uh, we're usually training depth is on a line so that you know exactly how deep you're going. So there's a very specific, I guess, like, way that you line dive where you like enter a certain way and you kind of like dolphin and you're trying as much as you can to follow the line. So the line will be like right here in front of my face as I descend. And you learn to kick really efficiently and you just want to like follow the line straight down. And then after about 60 feet, you're negatively buoyant. So that is the like, for me, that's the bliss point where you start to just Bare, like you can really lighten up on your kicking because you're essentially just free falling down. They call it the free fall. Really? Aspect. Oh, I didn't know that happens. So you're kind of being pulled down or not? I wouldn't say, I don't feel like I'm being pulled, but there's, there is this like gravity shift that happens where you almost, 
the, the first 30 feet are, are honestly kind of miserable. You're like, you're kicking a lot. I think if anyone snorkeled, they know the feeling. You're like, ah, this is like a lot of effort. Um, and then you kind of get to this neutral point where you're still, you're still kicking, but um, you start to feel this like, yeah, this, this, this effortlessness, I guess. Mm. And, um, and it feels like you're flying. Wow. And so sometimes I close my eyes or sometimes I just watch, you know, watch the rope or something. But that part for me is really, really, really blissful and fun because you're just like, you're just going. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, but then so you, you hit your like super fun free fall bliss point. And there is this aspect where you have to uh, decide when that part ends, essentially, because you do have to turn around and do the hard work to get (laughs) back up. Yeah, you're like, I want to ride this as long as possible. But in that part, from you know, I talk to a lot of divers, and that part is always that push and pull of like, "Ah, I don't want this part to end, but I also know I have to come back up. So, what is your relationship with, you know? bliss now versus suffering later (laughs) and um, yeah so then you then you turn you come back up and then it's the inverse where you feel so heavy you know you're you're coming back up and you're kicking under all this pounds and pounds of pressure and water and um when you're that deep actually you can't look up towards the surface you could um uh get a squeeze like collapse your trachea essentially so you, you can't like look towards the surface and go, okay, I only have like that much more to go. You just have to keep your head a little bit tucked and neutral. And in those moments, I just like, you have to trust, right? Like I'm going to get there. You have to trust. Like (laughs) I, I, there's, you can't rush. That's the thing is you can't rush. Yeah. You can't like, if your heart rate gets faster, then you're running out of breath, breath, right? Is that how it works? Exactly. So you're going to be less efficient. It's going to feel really hard. And so you have to know that you're not going to panic, that you're just going to keep with those even things because a lot of newer divers will want to you know, kick really hard and then it's actually like not as efficient. So you have to be really good at waiting, staying calm and just maintaining that pace. And then once you get to about 40 feet, 30 feet again, you start feeling the buoyancy and the upward pull and that's when I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm almost on the surface. Right. You just um, let it pick you up by that point. Yeah. Yeah. Then okay. you're like on this like little balloon going up and yeah, um, yeah. that's super fun too. But it's, it is so funny how these movement practices mirror so many journeys that we go on in life, yeah. right? Yeah. Where like, say you're starting a project and at the beginning you're excited, but it feels really mm. hard. And then you kind of hit your stride with it and you're just like, sailing your propelled you're moving and then maybe you hit a plateau and a point that you need to change something in your business or it's not working and then things get a little hard or a little scary and it's just taught me so much about moving through hard things in life and how if I can sit and work through those not panic not compare myself to other people's experiences um that there's generally like a lot of fun and a lot of learning on the other side of that. Yeah. I just got goosebumps. It's true. There's so much like metaphor in that experience itself of like going down, coming up in in life. And I, even the part about like learning to stay calm when it's hard, learning to trust and be patient when it's hard, because you can't rush. Like you can't like kick hard, faster or harder. And, and also like not even like looking up. Cause I would say looking up is like trying to look too far in the future. It's like, no, just stay focused on the now kick at your pace and trust that you'll get there. <laughs> I right. Love it. Yeah. Because especially if there's other people, you know, a lot of times there's multiple lines and we're all right. diving. Yeah, don't compare together. yourself to others. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Someone's already like, Oh, like maybe I should have gone faster. Yeah. It's not. Right. It's, it is, it becomes such a, a metaphor with, um, yeah, with sitting with our own journey and finding, like, like you said, not looking too far in the future, just like being here now in, 
and giving like the fullness of our attention and expression to that moment. Amazing. I think it's incredible that you've trained your body to stay calm and to do that. Now let's hear about our sponsor, Apostrophe. Skincare is not one size fits all, and finding the right skincare products can be overwhelming because it's hard to decide with all the options that are out there. That's why I'm excited to partner with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team to get customized acne treatments for your unique skin. Simply fill out an online consultation, snap a couple selfies, and a board certified dermatologist will create your first customized treatment plan with access to oral and topical medications. They offer treatments for all types of acne from head to toe. It's really nice to get to message a dermatologist who tailors a treatment plan for you. I mentioned another skin concern that I had relating to these small skin tech growths on my neck and the dermatologist directed me on what they were called and how I could go about treating them. Currently, we have a special deal for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash TLL when you use our code TLL. That's a savings of $15. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash TLL and click begin visit. Then use our code TLL at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. Another thing that's really fun to watch always is your acro yoga. Well, let's talk about what drew you to acro yoga and how has it changed you? Acro yoga is one of those other things that has become this giant metaphor in my life. Um, I started it quite late. So in my like mid to late twenties, which for getting into acrobatics seems like a quite random hobby or (laughs) skill. But to me, acro has been the most beautiful like way to learn about human connection and play and really honestly how to communicate, um, So there's obviously the physical practice, which is super, super fun. I get to do flips on people's feet. Like, what? (laughs) That's so much fun. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But I think on the bigger level, what has really attracted me to the practice of acro is your mindset has to be so playful. Like, you're going into this, like, you're literally spinning around on people's feet. Like, it's just the whole concept is kind of silly to begin with, you know? And of course, you can make it into beautiful art, but like, that's the starting point is is airplanes doing bird on people's. Yeah, Yeah. you're just playing. And um, it, you know, when when I teach acro, a lot of times people are like, oh, this is like doing airplane, like when I was a kid. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's literally the same. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing, just spiced up and looks, looks a little bit better, you know? Um, but it's, it's been such a fun practice and something I'd really encourage anyone to at least try a few times. It's mega awkward at first. I was like completely terrible. If someone had told me five years ago that I would be at the level I'm at now, I a hundred percent would have just been like, I don't think so. I don't think I can do this flippy turny whatever thing you know um but here I am so yeah yeah. I mean once you got into it how consistent were you practicing it because I imagine it's not easy you're falling a lot in the beginning um yeah tell us about that yeah in the beginning of acro it was yeah it is a lot of like awkwardness and falling I remember I used to get like these huge bruises on my hips and random other parts of my body because it's just like, it's unlike any other thing. Like when else are you balancing a lot on your stomach, you know? Um, so yeah, there was definitely a learning curve and what was challenging for me particularly was I live, you know, in Hawaii, most of the acro community is in Santa Monica, California. It's in San Diego. It's in a lot of these like beach towns or bigger cities and it hasn't quite made its way out out here yet so I was really only practicing you know when I would pass through these random places and could link up with teachers or take classes or go to retreats and stuff like that um but yeah I really fell in love with it and I think I like to say that like play 
um, and joy create mastery. And it definitely was something that just created so much joy for me that I was addicted and I wanted to do it as much as possible all the time. So I was going to like classes or I was going to um, like five day retreat immersions and just any little, any little bit of that I could get into it. Um, I was super motivated to do so. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's amazing, especially that you started it later in life too. Cause a lot of people at this age is probably like, Oh, it's too late for me to start anything. So especially something that's hard that requires a, like that much effort and practice. So what is your, I guess, what would you say to people who, who say something like that? Yeah, that's one of my favorite, I think, myths to dispel is that, yeah, if you're a certain age, you can't get into it. The best acrobats are generally people that are older because your technique, their their technique just gets so good um, that it doesn't require as much effort. And so it's a practice that feels really sustainable to me throughout a lifetime because there are people that are down at the green where I practice who are in their fifties, in their sixties, in their seventies, like it's super inspiring. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely, definitely never, ever too late to get into it. And also the other thing I like to say, I know most people see like me, I'm a pretty small girl and I'm a flyer, but, um, you know, anyone can fly, anyone can base. It's, um, it's, it is like, I would love to see more examples of like, uh, body inclusivity in, um, in the acro world and in the acro practice. And, um, I've been trying to highlight more acrobats that are, you know, women who are bases who are just absolute badasses and kill it. And just to show that there are avenues and expressions of, every body type and every interest level and skill level um, from there's a baby that's like two years old and his dad like brings him around and does acrobatic things and amazing older acrobats. So it's for everyone and anyone in my, in my opinion. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Next, I kind of want to ask you about like, what were the biggest obstacles that you'd ha- you had to overcome to get to where you are now in life? Because I do feel like you're in a place where you're successful, you're balanced, you're creative, and you're living in your joy. Like I really, like joy is a theme that keeps coming back that kind of I see as driving your life. Um, so what did you have to overcome to get to this point? I would say the biggest challenge that I had was a deep, deep sense of like my own unworthiness. And for a very, very big part of my life, there was a super different, like, or just this very hard voice and very hard narrative that would play in my head a lot. Um, and, and it almost didn't let me feel a lot of joy because even when there were good things happening, I felt unworthy of them. So even as my business started to get better, even as I got, uh, you know, more recognition, got good grades, did whatever it was, there was this part of me that just felt very like small and very unworthy. And it was just something that no one could really fix for me because it didn't matter. Like, the reflections that I got from other people, you know, amazing friends or whatever it is, but there was just something, um, in my own heart or in my own mind that felt like, yeah, yeah. But I I just was like, I, I I don't know. There was a sense of needing to like hide and, and not feel like I was, yeah, just not feel like I was worthy of any of these good opportunities coming my way. And so I would sell myself short. I would not want to like charge clients a certain amount, or I would not advocate for myself in certain ways. Um, because that was like a reflection of my own thoughts about myself, essentially. Mm. And then how do you feel like you overcame that? Cause I, that's very relatable. I think everyone listening can relate to that, honestly. Yeah. It's really only something that has honestly changed for me. And I would say the past 
like year. <laughs> like it's been a very a six months to a year. Um, strangely, there's been a few things that have really taught me a lot of lessons. Um, one of the biggest learning moments in my life has come from heartbreak. And I believe heartbreak has so much to teach us. And it's such a universal experience, but it feels so singular when you're in it. So from that space of going through a lot of like heartbreak and really, I think, wanting partnership because I wanted this like person to tell me I was loved and I was valued and I was worthy. Um, but having to go through a lot of these heartbreak experiences actually forced me to step into a space where I was like, how can I love myself in such a way that I don't need this sense of external validation or I don't need this partnership? Um, and that that switch has taken a long time. It's taken a lot of self-love meditations, a lot of affirmations, um, some little bit of fake it till I make it type of things. But um, I think that process of learning to fall in love with myself has changed my my internal landscape and my internal dialogue in such a way that I really started to feel that sense of like, wow, I like I do I do bring value to the world in the way mm -hmm. that I exist and add joy to other people's lives and it, it, it was just like, I don't know, it seems so simple, but it was such a life-changing thing for me. Um, but it really did come from getting to a super, super low space, I would say. I just felt very small and very disconnected from myself. And then having to kind of like life raft my own way out of that um, journaling and meditation being a big part of, of that process. Wow. I'm so happy for you that you you're like you got to that point where you feel like you truly love yourself and you're worthy. Um and it I think just the fact that you said it happened in the past year or so is like I I think people looking at you from the outside for for many years would have thought like wow, she's she has it all. She's amazing. She's blah 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 all the stuff. And it's you know, we all deal with self-worth issues. It just goes to show how how real, how common it is. And, but I'm, yeah, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's one of those where, like you said, from the outside, it would be very easy to look at my social media and go, oh my God, she has a million followers. She's doing all the travel. She can do acro or do all these things. And if you don't like have a voice inside your own head that is kind to you, those experiences are a little bit dulled. It's not that I didn't enjoy them, but they're a little bit dulled, whereas now everything feels like I can feel the fullness of everything yeah. because more vibrant. Um, yeah, there's yeah. so much more vibrance. And also what's been super, super beautiful is when people compliment me now, I actually can feel like I can receive it because before there was like a wall there of like because I didn't believe this thing about myself, I couldn't as deeply receive all the like love being reflected towards me, even though it was always present, it's always yeah. been there. Um, yeah. Now, because like that container, that part of like my heart is open, I can see it so much more. I can feel it so much more. Yeah. Um, and it's really motivated me and inspired me to uh, help other women and other like sisters in my friend group when they're going through those harder moments in life of heartbreak to just be like a really strong anchor um, for them because it's, I know how much growth can come out of that. And I just want everyone to feel the joy on the other side. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So I, I also want to ask you, what are you excited about now? Like what's next for you or yeah. What, what is bringing you excitement and joy? <laughs> oh, I love this one. Okay. So my, it's a, a bunch of things I'm excited about, but one thing I'm excited about is I want to restore an off-grid cabin. Um, and I think that is going to be my next project. Yeah. Cause you mentioned architect and interior design, like you have that background. Yeah. And I've just been so excited to have something and to pour into it and to, um, 
I don't know, become like a steward of something tangible, mm. if that makes sense. Very cool. Where's where is it gonna be? Do you have a place already or are you just planning? I'm planning. So there are some cabins here. They're very, very like rustic, very run down. Um, but I'm hoping that in December of this year, um, I will be able to maybe get one of those and then to spend quite a bit of time restoring it and just pouring love into it. And um, yeah, I think it'll be a good like anchoring point for me as well. I've been obviously somewhat nomadic for the last few years and yeah just to have something where I feel a little bit of a deeper sense of connection to uh, like a deeper sense of ownership to the Mm -hmm. community um and more inspired to create yeah just create something beautiful that I can live in um feels really really exciting that's super cool. And by off grid, you mean like it's self sustaining, like water, like everything, <laughs> food as well. Or <laughs> yeah, off grid for me that is more um, referring to power. So I think uh, it's gonna be off grid in the sense of like trying to do um, solar and that kind of that kind of off grid. I think unless I'm able to dig a well or something, which yeah, I don't know how any of that works. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know either. It's just something I'm excited to learn about and see what is possible. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be like a totally different type of venture and a type of creativity that I haven't been able to dive into as of yet. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, and I would also love to uh, launch or have something hosted like a meditation app. Mm. It's just a practice that I'm so passionate about. And I know there's a lot of resources out there, but um, yeah, I think I would love to create something that felt unique to my experience and are kind of what I like look for in meditation. So um, the journal, my, my journal, I, launched a journal called Notes to Self last year. And that was probably the most meaningful project that I've poured my heart into ever (laughs) in the course of my social media. And it's been the thing that's brought me just so much fulfillment. So looking for other avenues like that, where I can take some of the, the lessons and just little nuggets that I've learned and transfer them in an easy way to as many people as possible. just to be able to impact at scale is, feels really exciting. Yeah, love that. Um, do you have any final words of advice you want to leave with our listeners today? I think my advice for for anyone listening, um, A, is that it's it's never, ever, ever too late to try the thing that you're not sure that you can do. Everything that I do now has at one time been something that felt a little bit impossible. So I just want to encourage people to to feel capable of of doing hard things and uh the other aspect is to yeah to not shy away or not fear um those harder moments whether that is like heartbreak or a challenge or a time that something isn't going well for you um those moments have been the times where I call them sharpening times where it's like sharpened my focus or sharpened who I am as a person and to let those hard moments sharpen you into the best version and the more focused version and the most joyous version that you can be of yourself. Um, Because there's so much beauty to be found in those things that challenge us. And I believe that the things that challenge us become our greatest gifts and the places where we have the most to give and the most to teach others. So lean in. Love it. So beautiful. Okay, Chelsea, where can we find you online? You can find me at Chelsea Kawai on Instagram or chelsea Uh on the web. Amazing. Everyone, make sure you check out Chelsea Kawhi. I'll have all the links in the show notes below. Chelsea, thank you so much. I think you're so amazing, so inspiring, and I am just so happy we got to talk today. Thank you. Me too. I'm super inspired by your channel as well and how much mindfulness you're bringing into the world. So I'm 
always stoked to link up with a, a fellow creative and a woman leader. It's more than an honor. Thank you.